All right, this is video 13 on Plato's famous analogy of the cave. Uh, I just want to start by giving some, some context and background here. Um, this is from a dialogue called The Republic, which uh, Plato wrote in the middle of his career after, so it's, it's quite a while after Socrates has died. And Plato has begun to insert more of his own ideas into the dialogues he's writing. So this is less of a straightforward representation of what Socrates' original historical practice was like, and more of a uh, presentation of Plato's ideas, right? Um, so the dialogue this occurs in is called the Republic. And one of the things that this dialogue does is uh, Plato, through the mouthpiece of Socrates, outlines his vision for the perfect society, his vision for a utopia. And there's an interesting point of contact actually here between Plato and Confucius. Both Plato and Confucius were fundamentally authoritarians. That is, they are anti-egalitarians. They believed that some people should rule over others. Um, now, Confucius lived in a, uh, essentially a monarchy, an empire, uh, which uh, had that hierarchical structure that he approved of, but he didn't approve of the current regime the people who were in power at the time. Um, Plato lived in a democracy, um, and he actually did not approve of that. He wanted to, a return to a more uh, top-down authoritarian kind of government. Um, but both Plato and Confucius wind up confronting the same problem. What happens if a bad person becomes, uh, gets power. What do you do about a dictator, a person who is morally corrupt, but has control over the society? So the democratic solution to the problem of bad rulers is just to ensure that no one person ever have so much power that they can screw everything up right? You spread power evenly throughout the populace and you get power more or less distributed to average people. When you ha set up one person as a king or an authority, uh, you have to worry about a corrupt king. So both Plato and Confucius dealt with this problem by focusing on education. For they are both preeminently philosophers of education because they felt like the problem of society was a problem of getting vicious rulers. And if we can just teach the rulers to be virtuous, we will have a harmonious society. So um, they both focus on educating rulers to be good people. The cave occurs in Plato's dialogue about the ideal society, and it is a metaphor for education. So this is how the dialogue begins. And uh, I had you watch a, a movie version of it that was narrated by Orson Welles. And so I'm just going to sit here and wish I had Orson Welles's resonant baritone. And now let me show in a figure how our nature is enlightened or unenlightened. This is, whole thing is a metaphor for education, for enlightenment, for coming to know the truth. And one of the interesting things about Plato is that he is very, well, um, sometimes I think I, you could just divide philosophers, all philosophers everywhere, into two camps. The, the ones who think the world is as it seems, and the ones who think that there is a hidden reality behind things. 
and Plato is very much in the second camp. Um, so uh, the cave is a metaphor for coming to see, coming to understand that what you see isn't the real world, that there's something lying behind it. Um, and there are plenty of other metaphors in popular culture, for instance, um, that, uh, are, that illustrate the same idea. So, uh, you know, uh, a while back, a long time ago now, uh, there, there was a movie called The Matrix, which people may still see sometimes, in which um, Keanu Reeves discovers that he, the world around him is actually a, a computer simulation. There's also a great old movie called They Live by John Carpenter, where um, the, guy, the hero finds a pair of sunglasses, and he, he puts on the sunglasses, and he suddenly sees the hidden messages and everything around him. And so all the advertisements are just saying things like, stay asleep, consume, obey, that sort of thing. Um, this is another metaphor along those lines. It is a situation where um, someone comes to realize that the world is not as it seems. So it's easy enough to understand the central bit of the metaphor. The idea is that there are prisoners in a cave um, and behind them is a flame um, that is casting shadows on the wall and the prisoners in the cave think that the shadows that are being cast on the wall are the real things. Um, and they spend their whole lives just watching shadows on a wall, believing it to be reality. Um, and uh, enlightenment occurs when one of the prisoners is set free and is able to leave the cave um, where you just see fire and shadows and go out into the outside world and see the sun and real objects. Um, it's easy enough to get that much of the basics. Um, it's actually a, a pretty ornate and detailed picture. And so sometimes I uh, ask students to just sketch the cave and include as many details as possible. I mean, um, because working out the full image for yourself is, um, is helpful, right? And it help, makes you look carefully at the reading. Uh, I'm not doing that right uh, this semester, uh, I, but I do just want to note uh, a whole bunch of elements in this analogy that you may have, you may have missed, right? So the cave has an inside and an outside. Um, and well, I guess one thing I did ask you to do is identify, tell a story in an exercise uh, about an experience in your own life, which you could think of as coming to leave the cave or recognize that uh, things are not what they seem to be, right? And so um, at a very basic level, when you do that exercise, there's going to be something in your story that corresponds to the inside of the cave, the world of illusion, um, and the outside of the cave, the world of reality. Plato spends a lot of time talking about the experience of leaving the cave, too. And this is really nice. So he talks about how when you turn away from the shadows you've been watching your whole life, you are disoriented. And then when you go outside, the light is so much brighter than what you're used to. It takes you a long time to get used to what's going on. All of this is meant to be an analogy for the process of absorbing the new reality that you've been exposed to, right? He also talks about going back into the cave. Um, and one of the things he says is that this can be just as disorienting. And uh, if you see someone who see, doesn't seem to understand what's going on around them, maybe ask yourself, is this because he is confu um, he's ignorant um, or because he actually knows more than we do because he's been to the outside world and coming back into the world of the cave has disoriented him? One personal bit that I, I find really compelling is the idea that um, when the people are in the cave, 
they stare at the cave wall, they watch shadows, and they talk about the shadows, and they give honors and awards to people who can predict the motions of the shadows. And this, this is like a metaphor for societies and its concerns for superficial things, right? Um, a person who leaves the cave and comes back is going to look like a fool because among other things, they don't, they've forgotten how to predict what's going to happen with the shadows. They don't even care about the shadows anymore. But all of society is all wrapped up in these shadows. What are the shadows doing? What are the shadows thinking? What's going to happen next with the shadows? Um, and if you don't spend your time talking about the shadows, then you're considered a weirdo, right? But of course, once you're outside the cave, you know that they're just shadows. Um, people who try to tell the cave dwellers that they live in, that what they're looking at are just shadows, um, get a bad reaction. Um, they are rejected. They, uh, they could even be hurt or killed, right? Telling people their world is an illusion is um, not a message that people generally receive well. So, actually, there... Um, the, one of the parts of the analogy that's most important for Plato, but sometimes harder to put uh, when you're trying to come up with your own analogies for the cave, is the fire in the cave and the sun outside the cave. The idea is that the fire in the cave creates the shadows, right? The sun outside the cave illuminates the real objects and, you know, it gives the plants nutrients so they can grow, right? Um, so the fire in the cave is like a pale imitation, a, a cheap version of the real thing, which is the sun. Um, and so both the fire and the sun have uh, epistemological and metaphysical functions. Um, so the, these were vocab terms that I introduced in the previous section, and you still need to know them. They could be on the test. Um, Remember, epistemology is the study of knowledge, what it is and how to get it. And metaphysics is the study of existence, what it is and what kinds of things have it. So um, the sun and the fire are both epistemological metaphors because they are what allow us to see things, right? The fire lets us see the shadows, the sun lets us see objects in the real world. So these things give us knowledge, that's epistemology. These things are also responsible though for existence, metaphysics. Um, the shadows would not exist without the fire. The real world would not exist without the energy from the sun, right? Um, and so part of moving from false images to real things involves actually going up a chain that has four elements. There's the shadow on the wall, and then there's the fire that allows us to see the shadow on the wall and uh, is the reason the shadows on the wall exist, right? And so just turning around in the cave and seeing the fire is one level of enlightenment. But it's not the final level of enlightenment because the whole process gets repeated again when you actually go outside, right? If you, once you see the fire, you are drawn to the real light outside. And at first, you don't, you're not able to look at the sun. You are only able to look at the objects. And then maybe you can look at the reflection of the sun in a pool. But eventually, especially if the sun is low on the horizon, I guess, you can look right at the sun um, and... Um, then you are finally looking at the ultimate truth. So you get four levels, right? Shadows, fire, inside the cave. And then outside the cave, real objects, and the sun. Okay. And so if you really want to have something that fits the cave analogy well, it's going to have those all four of those levels. Okay. Um, oh, and I guess this is my last bullet point here. Right? The shadows on the wall 
the puppets that cast the shadows, the things, the reflections of objects in the water, the things themselves. It's a slightly different way of breaking it down, but it boils down to the same thing. You've got four levels. Okay, so that gives you a sense of the power of this as an analogy for, like Plato says, how the soul is enlightened or unenlightened. I want to talk for a bit now about how Plato wanted us to use this analogy. Um, and here we're going to get into some of the background on who Plato was as opposed to who Socrates was, right? Um, we've learned about Socrates. We've learned that he went around Athens talking to people and asking annoying questions. Um, so uh, all of these conversations got written down by Plato. So who was Plato and why did he become interested in Socrates? Well, in fact, Plato was a wrestler. Um, and the name Plato was not his given name. It was his wrestling name. So, you know, it's like um, we're reading the philosophy of Hulk Hogan or uh, The Rock or something. Um, so this is from a comic book called Action Philosophers, which explains philosophers and has nice comic book art. Um, so the name Plato means broad. It was his wrestling name. So it's like big guy, you know, broad shoulders. Um, but um, he uh, didn't do too well as a wrestler. So um, he, went, um, he went and became a philosopher. Um, Aristotle, who was a student of Plato, gives us the following account of Plato's, the evolution of Plato's ideas. Got three sources here, actually. Um, we don't start with Socrates. Actually, we, we want to start with a philosopher named Heraclitus. Heraclitus's most famous saying was that you cannot step into the same river twice, right? Because... You, you put your foot in the river, you take your foot out, you put your foot back in. It's different water. water the water's gone on. You can't step into the same river twice because everything is changing. As a result, um, you can't really know anything in, in this world of the senses. It was kind of a skeptical conclusion. That's what Plato walked away from it with. Then Plato meets Socrates. Socrates also um, is interested in knowing things. And he wants, he's, he's on this quest to find out the definition of ethical terms. So he goes up to Euthyphro and asks what piety is. Hmm. So Heraclitus says we can't know things in the senses. Socrates says we must know what are ethical ideas. Um, then the, the third element is a group of um, a cult, actually, a math cult called the Pythagoreans. Um, and the idea with the Pythagoreans is that they believed that numbers were gods, particularly the number 10. Uh, and they had various reasons for selecting the number 10 as the big, biggest god. Um, and all other things exist because they are made out of numbers. That may seem like it's a weird thing, but to this day it attracts physicists who get really involved with the equations of physics and think that that represents reality. So Plato puts these three ideas together to create his theory, what gets called the theory of the forms. The definitions of terms exist apart from sensible things. Well, let me break this down more slowly so that you can begin to understand what's going on. Start again with Heraclitus. He lived in what is now Turkey in a town called Ephesus. He died about 500 BCE, so actually well before um, Plato and Socrates. His work survives only in fragments. Um, but again, here's his most famous saying. One cannot step twice into the same river, nor can any one grasp mortal substance in a stable condition, but it scat scatters and again it gathers, it forms and dissolves 
it approaches and departs. So meanwhile, um, Socrates, Plato um, has failed as a wrestler. He uh, never qualifies for the real Olympics. He thinks he's going to do a career switch. Um, uh, Plato s sees, though, that people on a quest for knowledge, like Socrates, wind up getting killed. That's kind of a big deal, too. So he's kind of got bad luck. He's had bad luck as a wrestler, and now um, he's seeing that um, being a philosopher can, it can really can get you killed. So he leaves, um, and then he winds up in Sicily, and this is where he encounters the Pythagoreans. Um, so I'll just read from the comic here. Pythagoras, he of the triangle theorem fame, right? The three, uh, the a squared plus b squared equals c squared, founded a bizarre cult of math hippies in the 6th century who believed that they could comprehend the nature of the cosmos through numbers. And again, you might say to yourself, what? Uh, comprehend the universe through numbers? This makes sense to physicists to this day. People use different numbers. People don't. So um, the, the Pythagoreans worshipped the number 10 in particular, and the triangle diagram you see there, made of 10 circles arranged like that, uh, one, two, three, four, was a holy symbol for them. Well, physicists these days don't use numbers like that, but there's still this sense that you can understand the world through number. So what's going on? Pythagoras was probably a real man. Uh, he was probably born about 580 BCE, uh, and learned math in Egypt. Um, it's possible he might have learned math in Mesopotamia. Both the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians knew the um, Pythagorean theorem, but not in the form that, that the Pythagoreans later prove it in. Um, so the Pythagoreans believe that all is number, numbers are gods. Um, this, is a, this was weird, so they are run out of town by suspicious locals, and many of them are murdered. So they were in Sicily, um, and uh, they wind up, actually, many of them wind up as refugees back in Athens. So, all is number is the watchword of the Pythagoreans. Now, let's think about how everything can be number. Well, interesting thing about a number like two. Um, it represents a vast number of uh, all sorts of different collections of things. So, okay, um, hang on. Right here are two Legos, right? Um, the number two captures this, but the number two actually also captures the number of dice, uh, the number of feet you probably have, the number of robots in that picture, right? The number two is an abstract entity that manages to, manages to gather together a bunch of particulars, right? So the Pythagoreans think of number as abstract entities that manage to bring together particulars. Now remember Socrates though. Actually, let's let's scooch back to the, the, the slide where these all come together. Socrates was looking for the definitions of ethical terms, and he didn't want just examples of ethical terms, like things like virtue or piety. He wanted something that could be explained in words. So we put this we put these two together. We put Socrates and the Pythagoreans together and we get what Plato was looking for. Abstract ideas that can cover ethical terms. The definitions that Socrates uh, was looking for is part of the realm of pure number that the Pythagoreans worshipped, right? And so now we get to Plato's definition of the idea of the forms. So uh, in the comic, uh, they've got Plato. Um, uh, Plato knows he, um, he, they have him talking kind of like a, a 
Tarzan wrestler kind of. But the point is that um, uh, Plato um, knows what Socrates says he didn't know, right? That is, um, the real truth about abstract objects um, is like the truth about numbers. So the truth about piety is like the truth about numbers. So a standard example, actually, that we now talk about uh, in modern terms is chairs. There's an idea of chair represented by the dotted figure in the, in the um, cartoon. The idea of chair somehow represents, well, the idea of chair encompasses all the other regular chairs. All sorts of different things go by the name chair, right? And yet somehow we manage to recognize them all as being examples of the same general thing, chair. Well, how is that? That's because we've got in our heads a general idea of chair. Um, this is what Plato talks about when he talks about the forms. And again, this might seem kind of nutty, but it has um, a lot of modern parallels. Uh, the theory of language that's dominant now, um, it's called the Chomskyite theory of language, has a lot of this in it. Um, somehow we managed to learn to talk as babies. And to do that, we have to recognize properly formed sentences in whatever language we're learning. And we never get examples. Uh, we never get in. We learn ultimately to be able to recognize infinitely many sentences. And yet we're only given a finite number of examples. And many of our examples are badly formed. Well, what, how, how is it that we have this ability to recognize an infinite number of things from a finite um, number of imperfect examples. It has to be that we've got access to the pure idea. So in language, they say that the grammar, uh, our knowledge of human grammar is innate. Um, for Plato, he felt that knowledge of the forms was innate. You had all of that knowledge in your soul. You just needed to wake it up the right way. Okay. So the realm of the forms. Um, we can imagine it. You've got chairs and ideas and numbers. This is, and honestly, um, a lot of philosophers may seem like they are just in just total space cadets. And well, I suppose we are, but it's because we spend time in the realm of ideas with the numbers and the chairs. Pure ideas. All right, so <clears throat> uh, I want to give you a quick rundown of the theory of the forms, and then we're going to return to the analogy of the cave. The definitions that Socrates thought, sought after exist on their own. They are called forms. The, there's a form of piety and a form of virtue. Um, just like there is, a, and they exist the same way the number two exists, however that is. Forms are real. Forms are more real than regular things. Things in our world are like the thing, are like Heraclitus's river. You step in it and it changes, so you can't step in it twice. But the forms are always the same. The number two is always the same. The form of piety is always the same. These things have no sensory qualities. They're not physical. They're not things you sense. They're things you understand with your mind and your mind alone. All the physical things exist because they participate in the forms. What does that word participate mean? It's never really explained that well. But somehow the same way that the sun gives light to the plants and the fire casts shadows on the walls, the forms create the, the particular things that we see. And they are able to unify particular sensory objects. The reason why all of these different kinds of things that get called chairs are chairs is because of the form of chair. Um, chair isn't actually Plato's main example. Mostly he uses natural objects, um, 
people is a, is a good one. Um, and then numbers, because he's still a Pythagorean. All right, so what's the conclusion here? Let's go back to the, um, the, the story of the cave. Socrates says, but if I am right, certain professors of education must be wrong. When, where are they wrong? Well, they say that you can put knowledge into the soul which was not there before, like putting sight into blind eyes, or like you're just pouring olive oil into a jar, right? That's not the way education works. It's not that I have knowledge and that I put it in your brain, like um, it's just, like an exchange of money. Another really great philosopher, the Brazilian Paulo Freire, calls this the banking model because he think he's like people think that passing on knowledge is just like passing on money, and that teacher is like a banker, but it's not like that at all. It's not like that because um, if it wasn't there, you couldn't put it there to begin with. Um, the power and capacity to learn exists in the soul already. So it's not like putting sight into blind eyes. It is like turning the body to face the light. You turn the body away from the shadows on the wall and towards the fire and then ultimately the sun. This is a move that Plato thinks has to happen with your whole body, um, which is then a metaphor for your whole soul. Education is not the transfer of knowledge from one hard drive to another. Education is a transformation of the soul that turns it towards what is real and most important. <sighs>